Hello my YouTube family, welcome back to the Haxton Knits channel. My name's Deanna and I'm an American living in Okinawa, Japan. And this week we're going to take a couple of really weird deep dives. Uh, I'm talking about socks this week. And not just any old socks, really old socks. than I think maybe the average person. Maybe that's esteeming too much about myself, but something I really love to do is just kind of like find a subject and just nerd out on it, go down the rabbit hole, learn all the things, be able to talk about it. I think if you're passionate about something, knowing the history of it and like all those nerdy details really is important. And so I've been rereading this bad boy right here if you are also a fellow nerdy knitter, um, you probably are familiar with this book. I know I've talked about it a lot on this channel. I'm sorry guys. But A History of Hand Knitting by Richard Rutt. This book is, I mean, it's a very approachable book. It's not too big. It's got some pretty cover work. There are a ton of pictures inside. And so if you're kind of a nerdy knitter like me, it's a book worth picking up and reading. And I have been rereading and so socks let's talk why am I talking about socks okay just just bear with me follow along I'm reading Richard Rutt's book of a history of knitting and I'm thinking to myself about another book that I have uh, which was I don't have it in front of me but the principles of knitting and how much I enjoyed the interview with the author of that book that was hosted over on the Fruity Knitting channel where you get to listen to the author and like just hear her passion about her work and, and the process of writing her book and I thought wouldn't it be cool to see like a video or an interview with Richard Rupp and listen to him talk about his book and his process um, and I didn't find that sorry that's not what this is but, um, so as I was, so as I was kind of digging down the YouTube rabbit hole and the Google rabbit hole and like my local library and just trying to find something, what I discovered was a reference to the fact that all of his knitting book, his like historical knitting book collection has been uploaded into archive.org. And so that sent me down what's essentially my rabbit hole of this week. So all of these knitting manuals, um, most of them are like 1880, 1890. That's kind of the ones that were available in his collection. And I've just been kind of, you know, picking at random, opening them up, reading them and enjoying them. And in the course of um, looking at all these books, I, you know, some of it's been very humorous and interesting. Um, I've noticed a lot of the books they kind of like take jabs at other um, yarn brands like they're always talking about how you really shouldn't use that inferior wool and how you should like be on the lookout. Oh gosh one of the books was all about it was obviously a promotional book for a silk yarn and three like in the first page there's three warnings about how you have to be cautious about knockoffs and inferior yarns and how you know, their yarn is specially made on these light bobbins, so you get more yarn. And, and other knockoff brands, you know, they use these heavy bobbins to hide the fact that you're not getting that much yarn. But it wasn't just that book. It's like book after book after book. It's like, don't use this inferior yarn. <laughs> so I thought that was very interesting. I feel like nowadays we're all a little more sensitive to each other, or we try to be at least. And like, instead of knocking down other companies, we say, well, oh yeah, they make good yarn, but you know, I like this yarn, or maybe for that project it would be good, but for this project, maybe this one. I'm rambling. You get where I'm going at here, right? So interesting, just a thing to note. Another interesting thing I noticed was that all of the authors were um, Miss Hope, Miss Lewis, Miss Bradford, like no first name, just Miss, I guess not Miss, Mrs, because they were all married women. I guess, 
married women of the 1880s could write knitting manuals, but they couldn't have first names. One of the books that really caught my interest was um, Knitting to the New Code. And this manual seems to be um, a manual laying out what sort of education school children should receive in the needle arts. And they talk about, you know, by this age you should be able to do groups one, two, three, and four. And by this age you should be able to do groups blah blah blah. And so for an example, a seven-year-old should be able to um, darn and you know patch up a hole by darning and fix a hem and sew a, a square hem and all of these other things and I think like huh, I, uh, the seven year olds I know today I don't even want them to like hold a knitting needle for fear that they might like stab someone with it. Maybe uh, maybe I underestimate seven year olds of this era because I don't have a seven year old of this era but you get what I'm going at here. Kids, back in the day, in school, were doing some real work. And, of course, the reason they were doing real work is because they were doing real work. Child labor, you know, it was a thing. So also in this book, Knitting to the New Code, are a series of rules. Rules. Like, 20 rules for sock knitting. And I think I'm going to read one of these to you directly. I hope you don't mind. Rule number one. Are there any rules about beginning to knit socks or stockings? The rules about beginning to knit socks and stockings are the knitting should be cast on rather loosely, the end of wool or cotton should be knitted into the first six stitches, so essentially weaving your ends in as you go, which I don't, I don't know if I agree with, but if it was good enough to be taught in school in the 1800s, I guess it's good enough for me. The knitter's hands should be freshly washed, an inch measure should be at hand, and the knitter should not talk while knitting. I would die. I would absolutely die. Um, I guess that's true of any sort of school subject is you're not supposed to talk while you're learning, but just a fun thing. It goes on to do all sorts of like when knitting flat, what are the rules? When knitting round, what are the rules? Etc. 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 So the next book that I, you know, just at random picked up to look at was called Wools and How to Use Them. It was published in 1884 by Mrs. Lewis. And it talks about all the different types of wools that are out there. And I, you know, I hit favorite to save that one because I figured if I ever wanted to work on some old patterns that it might be helpful. I might be able to figure out like, oh, what kind of a wool is this? Because one thing that you'll notice when you dig into these books is that they, they don't tell you your gauge. They tell you what size needles to use and what type of yarn to use, which may or may not actually tell you like the weight of the yarn. Also in this book were a series of sock patterns and you know, it just got me thinking, I want to knit a sock from an 1800s knitting book. That would be really cool. I actually really want to knit socks from much older, like much, much older, but um, alas, the patterns, they're kind of hit or miss, they're hard to get your hands on. So the desire to want to knit some really old socks came from this book because there are some lovely pictures of old, really, really old, like Egyptian old socks. Um, and unfortunately I had to go on the internet to find the color pictures of these. So warning, if you are looking to purchase this particular book, the earlier editions have the like nice color prints of all of the pictures and they're all in nice order. This particular edition, which I think is the 1987 publication, I might, I might be wrong. Check your books when, <laughs> when you order them because this one, almost all of the pictures are in black and white and they aren't lined up the way they were in the original text. It makes it a little hard to find like what specific thing the text is trying to reference. But if you go online, you can find pictures of these old socks, like not the like Roman era Egypt socks that were made out of knob bending, but the, the some of the early knitted socks that are blue and white and have like these really intricate stranded color work on them. They are stunning. I'll see if I can find a picture to link to here or at least like throw a link below. So the next book that I was looking at, it was called Wools and How to Use Them. It was published in 1887 by Mrs. Lewis, the distinct, the distinguished Mrs. Lewis. Um, 
and in it is a chart for knitting socks by various sizes. It tells you like how many stitches to cast on each needle, how long to knit. It's like a really cool little schematic. Basically, I could see this like printed and laminated and like tucked in your knitting bag because it was just like for a man's sock size four, five, and six. I don't know what those sizes actually correspond to, but you get the idea. And then for a lady's sock and then for a child's sock. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to just knit some socks from the 1800s? I think that'd be really cool. And fair warning, if you are interested in historical knitting or have done a fair amount of uh, historical knitting, you're probably gonna giggle because I had some challenges along the way. And the first was uh, reading the pattern. So the first thing I noticed is that they tell you that I'm going to knit myself a pair of gentleman socks and they should be knit on size 15 pins or 16 if you're a loose knitter or was it the other way around? I don't know. So of course, uh, what is a size 15 pin or size 16 pin? And uh, I thought it was very smart. I like Googled those pins and I came up with this like Imperial UK standard sizes, which turned out to be really wrong. It's like, they're not the same. And then I found this picture in one of the books and it was for an old fashioned knitting gauge. It was kind of interesting. You could um, take an envelope, put stamps in it and mail it to the publisher of the book and they would mail you back a knitting gauge. It was like 16 pence or one shilling, depending on whether you wanted the metal one or the electric coated one. So I was looking at that gauge and it's numbered like one through 26, one being the biggest and 26 being the smallest. And I thought, well, it, I mean, I'm, I'm visually looking at a picture in a book, but it looks like the like 25, 26 sizes are like a US zero, double zero, triple zero. You know, you know what I mean? So uh, if I'm looking at that gauge, a size 16 is like maybe, I don't know, a US size three. I was wrong. I, yeah, that's, that's wrong. That's not, that's not how it works. So further Googling, uh, what really tipped me off that I was wrong was that the pattern asked for me to cast on like 86 stitches. And so on a US size three needle, 86 stitches, it's gonna be a kind of a big sock, you know, kind of a big sock. So um, I finally figured out through the Googles that they used, um, you know, steel knitting needles and that they would have been wire gauges. So it's like steel wire gauge size. And from that, I was able to figure out that this pattern wanted a, a, a size that would have been like a 1.6 millimeter which falls somewhere between a double zero and triple zero in US sizes. So let's show you what I got. Of course, this pattern is going to be um, knit on double pointed needles. Specifically, it calls for four double pointed needles because it tells you to cast on, you know, so many stitches on needles one, two, and three. I'm not doing that. And as a result, I'm having to put stitch markers in to indicate where needles one, two, and three are. But I got myself some double zero needles. These are my Chiagu lace minis, which I am absolutely in love with. And this yarn is the thinnest yarn I own. So I don't do a lot of lace thinning. I think your viewers of my channel will probably think, no, yeah, I don't really have anything on lace weight yarn. I am doing some lace knitting, but it's on a thicker yarn right now. Um, so this is literally the thinnest yarn that I have. And this is Malabrigo sock yarn. Uh, which is really, it's a, they say it's a fingering weight, but I would call it a little bit lighter than a fingering weight. So if you are a stickler for the rules of the Craft Yarn Council, I am using knitting needles that are too small for the weight of the yarn, but that's okay. We're going to just, you know, press on and forget that there are rules like that because, um, yeah, screw the rules. So another thing I found interesting as I was working on this pattern, again, it was designed to be knit on double pointed needles and they tell you exactly how many stitches go on each, which essentially makes stitch markers not necessary because you can talk about how many, you know, needle one, needle two, needle three. And then the other thing they recommended was this. So the start of round, they add a stitch specifically to indicate the start of round. And in um, wools and how to use them, it tells you, <laughs> did I say it like that? 
it tells you some knitters like to indicate the start of round with a purl stitch on every single row. But me, Mrs. Lewis, the distinguished, I like to do alternating knit and purl. So you ended up with basically like one garter stitch. And Mrs. Lewis likes to do this because it makes it easier for counting your rounds because basically every garter ridge is two. So you can easily go two, four, six, eight, ten, two, four, six, eight, twenty, two, four. So I'm like 24 rows into this pattern. Uh, so yeah, interesting, exciting. Right now I'm obviously on just the ribbing part and I'll keep working on that. Um, I haven't looked too far ahead in this pattern yet because, well, because I haven't, but I haven't looked to see what kind of a heel they use. I'm kind of excited to see like, oh, it's a secret, you know. Um, God, I'm a nerd. But in the other book I was talking about, Knitting According to the New Code, they actually talk about all different types of heels and different types of things. So I discovered like the little mini socks I've been working on. I've been apparently doing the Margaret heel. Um, who knew? I didn't know. There were names for these things. So I'll have to let you know when I get there what kind of heel we're using for this particular sock. Um, interesting thing about knitting socks out of history books is that I'm doing it just for the sake of learning and I don't, I don't know if I'm actually going to knit two socks. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so the next problem I encountered was the yarn. So I told you before, they don't give you a gauge, they just tell you what size knitting pins to use and what yarn to use. And in this case, we were using the Sicilian six-fold yarn. And luckily for me, I'm holding the book wools and how to use them, so surely they're gonna tell me what kind of wool that is. Let me read you exactly what Sicilian six-fold <laughs> wool is. <sighs> Sicilian six-fold, the same, but finer. That won't make sense unless I read you the whole list. So they list them all by different types. So there's like Aloha for shooting hose and deep sea mission. Scotch fingering, number one, number two, number three, number four, number four and a half. Sicilian eightfold is strong and thick yet soft for superior knitting. Sixfold, the same, but finer. So that is all I know is um, it is strong and soft for superior knitting but finer than Sicilian Eightfold. Helpful. Uh, I tried to Google, you know, just search. Uh, I didn't find it. Did not find Sicilian Sixfold yarn. So if you have some Sicilian Sixfold yarn from the 1800s or maybe a drawing of a label or an advertisement. So I did go searching through, you know, some of the older books looking for an advertisement for Sicilian Sixfold knitting yarn knitting wool, whatever you call it. So uh, if you see something like that, maybe put it below and share it with the rest of us. That would be great. Okay, gosh. If you also really enjoy like kind of deep dive nerdy stuff, there's a couple of YouTube channels. Channels? Channels. There are a couple of YouTube channels that I have been watching lately. One of the channels that I have been thoroughly enjoying is Roxanne Richardson, especially her series called Casual Fridays. She talks knitting like a pro. She talks history, she talks like fashion, and just, I'm not gonna do her justice, but super interesting, super like knowledgeable on all things knitting. And if you enjoy kind of a deep dive into knitting stuff, uh, go check out her channel. I was just watching today her history of 19th century knitting, kind of like, in the Americas with the Mountaineer women and um, she also was talking a little bit about like the history of knitting terms and terminology and things like that. Super interesting, super nerdy, um, absolutely love that channel. And then another one I've been watching is Ask a Mortician. So Caitlin Dowdy, Ask a Mortician is the channel and this is um, not knitting related in the slightest but uh, also a nerdy deep dive it's a channel where you have a person who's obviously like super knowledgeable at a super niche thing and it's just you can tell she's loving sharing that knowledge with the world so she talks about corpses and dead bodies and um, the history of how we dealt with bodies and weird cases where people dug bodies out of the ground and put them on trial and made their like lawyers crouch behind them and you know speak for the dead things like that. So super nerdy channel, super interesting. You should go check her out. 
gosh, I'm trying to remember. I also was listening to this um, ancient, ancient Egyptologist who is also another woman who's like super knowledgeable all things Egypt, ancient Egypt. I really want to like send her a message and be like, could you talk about the knitting in Egypt or the knob bending? Because you know, it was like Roman era Egypt. I think that's after what's considered ancient. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. She can tell us, right? So what was like the ancient Egypt era and what was like the Roman Egypt era and the modern Egypt? I don't know what the Egyptian eras are. But she does super interesting things. She um, also talks about like cosmetics in Egypt and makeup and styles and artwork and how that artwork has like carried on through the ages and been like used throughout all the different eras. Yep. Yep, that's all I gotta say about nerdy YouTube channels. For all of you who have been patiently with me, sticking with me up to this point, I'm hoping that you have already noticed behind me this lovely piece of finished object. Oh yeah. Um, it is on there and not on me because it's actually pretty much still soaking wet. Um, yeah. But, you know, what, what I do for the YouTube channel. So, this is The Night Book by Rachel Ilsley. Um, forgive me for last week. I definitely said the wrong name, but you guys are with me. It's, it's written out on the bottom. I promise what I write on the bottom is usually correct. So, this guy, all over color work, as you can see, just flew off the needle. I know, I know color work can be slow, but it's so fun. Like, it's fun. I love knitting this and like the longest part of this I swear was this little cuff right here because it wasn't as fun. <laughs> so no major changes on this particular pattern. I knit the size medium. I'm surprised I'm usually kind of a medium large uh, but the medium is fitting very very well. I did choose to omit the sleeves and then uh, change up the cuffs just a little bit as I mentioned last week. So. Oh god, this is wet and I wasn't planning on taking it down from here, but as I mentioned last week, the collar of this is a uh, one by one twisted rib that is folded over and I didn't want to do that for the bottom edge of this particular sweater. So what I did instead is actually, I'm really in love with it, I did a double knit edge on this. So this is the inside, you can see the contrast color, and then this is the outside. Basically, I stuck to exactly the same knitting needle size. I didn't go down in size or in stitch count. Um, and then I did one row where in my main color, I knit one, slip one with yarn in front. So knit one, slip one with yarn in front. The next row, I joined my contrast color and I did slip one with yarn in back, purl one, slip one with yarn in back, Pearl one and just alternated as you do for double knitting. I I have a confession. I really don't enjoy double knitting. So as a result, I don't knit it the way uh, most double knitting is done where you carry both yarns and you bring both forward and back as you work your way across the row. I do it in two passes. So the front side I do in one pass, slipping the back side stitches in the, oh, um, not necessarily the backside stitches. In this case, because it's no color changes, it's all main color on the front, contrast color on the back, I did slip all of the backside stitches, but um, if it's a more complicated stitch pattern, I will do one pass with one color and the other pass with the other color. Um, so maybe that will help you. For me, that significantly helped my gauge and my tension and my evenness when it comes to double knitting, um, and it also sped me up quite a bit. My tip, free to you. This thing was great, I loved it. I want to knit like 25 more of them. I'm gonna stop holding it up now because I'm just gonna stretch it out of shape because it is uh, damp. That is actually all of my knitting today. All of it, yep. I'm gonna talk a little bit about life here in Japan, specifically that thing behind me if you wanna stick around. Otherwise, you guys have a great day. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits. And if you like this channel, I'd really appreciate it if you give it a thumbs up or comment below. Comments make me happy, even if they're like just chatter. Like, put them down there. They, I can't explain 
how much joy it brings me to see like the chatter on the channel. Um, I've had a lot of new subscribers recently too, so it's been exciting to see you guys come. I think it was my video on Koichan knitting that kind of attracted. That was the one that had a lot more um, visitors to it than average. So hi guys, welcome to the channel. I'm so glad you're here. Um, yeah, let's get on to life in Japan. So it is April here in Japan. I think it's April in the whole world, right? Everywhere it's April. Uh, and April is the holiday season here in Japan. That's right. So the last week of April we celebrate Golden Week and it is the biggest national holiday uh, because it's actually four holidays. Uh, and there's this cool rule in Japan where like if a workday falls between two holidays, it's also a holiday so you get it off. That's a cool rule. So, Golden Week starts uh, April 29th with Showa Day, which is the celebration of Emperor Showa. And then, oh gosh, there's the Constitution Day, and then there's Greenery Day, which is the day where you go outside and like, enjoy the trees, enjoy the plants, you know. And then the last day, which is actually May 5th, is Children's Day. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's like, Boys Day. Sun's Day, because there's a there's a, a another holiday later on that's Girls Day, uh, but now we call it Children's Day, and so that's actually what you see behind me. I hope you can see these. Um, these are little wind socks, and they are carp, and you put these out and they represent uh, the father of the family, the mother of the family, and then typically the son of the family or you know subsequent sons. I think nowadays you'll see more like one for every child regardless of gender. But the idea is that you are going to pray for your children to be strong and to be able to like swim up the stream the way the carp do and like you know be successful in life despite all of its um, you know, flow against you. As you can see behind me, uh, this, this, this particular windsock's got just two little fishies on here. That's because I don't have any children. Um, which means probably I shouldn't put this up. But you know what? It's, it's kind of cool looking and I kind of like it and I've always wanted one. And I'm probably just going to like put it in the part of my yard where no one can see but me anyway. And I'll enjoy it and love it forever and whatever. You know, that's how life goes. Um, this one behind me is actually a very small, kind of cheap version. I got it at my local Make Man store. Make Man, for those of you who aren't Japanese, is um, like a home improvement store, like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or whatever you got in the rest of the world, because I only know US home improvement stores. Hey, in Japanese now. So uh, they actually get huge, like really, really big. Uh, like a couple hundred bucks for each one and then like the top oof, the top banner would actually have like some sort of symbol or logo of your household your house name of some sort so beautiful I've always loved these I've thought frequently about buying these as presents for like my families back home but they are like kind of expensive uh, so when I saw this one uh, when I was over at the Home Depot the other day the Make Man. So when I saw this one over at the Make Man Day, I snatched it up, and of course it just came with this base one, and then you had to keep tacking on for each additional children. So if you are in a large household with lots of little children, yeah, they get kind of pricey. But I'm presuming that this is like holiday decoration where you buy it once and then you tuck it away and you reuse it year after year. So I guess it's not that expensive. So anyway, in Japan during this week. Everything shuts down, everyone's on a holiday, everyone's closed. I am hopeful that we aren't going to see a giant rise in coronavirus cases following Golden Week. We did see a bit of a rise last year following Golden Week because everybody's traveling to be with their family. So hopefully, cross your fingers, not this time around, right? No, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we'll see a rise in coronavirus cases. So if you are living in Japan or the Asian countries and want to just be extra safe and stay home and not travel and take care of yourself this holiday season, that would be awesome. That's what I'm going to do. And I think that's actually all I'm going to talk to you about today for life in Japan. I'm so glad you stayed with me for this little chat and I'll see you next week.
Mix up. 